Thank you for joining me for this episode. Today, we're going to be talking about Topotox, Myopia's Fantastic Four with Dr. Cheryl Chapman on the Myopia Podcast. Welcome to the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Before we get started with this episode with Dr. Chapman, I wanted to mention that Oculus generously supported this particular podcast. So grateful for them and their amazing technology. It's helping practitioners around the world with their management of myopia. Thanks again for joining us for this episode. I'm stoked to have uh, my good friend Cheryl Chapman on the podcast with us. Uh, How are you doing, Dr. Chapman? I'm doing awesome. Thank you for having me, David. It's always good to see you. And I uh, always enjoy talking with you about myopia management. Yeah. You've been on the podcast a couple of times. This is, I think, the first podcast since we've lectured together, uh, which was absolutely a a joy. For those who don't know you, um, tell us a little bit about where you practice and uh, your maybe uh, experience in the myopia world. Yeah, so I practice. I'm uh, five days a clin- five days a week in clinic in Gretna, Nebraska, which is just a little suburb outside of Omaha. Um, and I find that to be really useful because when I am talking about myopia management, having um, you know on the ground uh, experience in the clinic, doing myopia management day in and day out, I feel like it um, helps me be a little bit better in touch with what doctors are going through. Um, I serve as the current president for the American Academy of Orthokeratology and Myopia Control. Um, So I'm very closely involved with planning our Vision by Design conference, which um, has a great boot camp for doctors who need to learn more about myopia management and um, how to incorporate it into their practices and get started. Um, And then we follow that boot camp up with some more in-depth CE on the topic. Yeah. So I've been doing my OP management for 15 years. I've been to Vision by Design. Um, I had, a, I had a, a break of about four or five years where I didn't go, but we went again last year. My associate who does some myopia management, my resident who was just getting into myopia management, we all decided, hey, let's see what the boot camp is all about. I didn't figure I would really need a whole lot of it. And and I was kind of right. Like there were some things that I knew a lot of, but that's part of why we do education is it reteaches us the things that we know and it just sharpens our sword. And so whether you are brand new to myopia management or are you wanting to refresh yourself in it, the boot camp, I would say, is spectacular. The rest of the meeting's pretty darn good too, but I would recommend anybody wanting to get into myopia management to hit up the boot camp for sure. That's not why we're here to talk, although I love talking about uh, meetings to make us better. Um, You know, a big part of myopia management, particularly in the world of contact lenses, is our topographies. And especially within the world of orthokeratology, which I know both you and I, from having lectured with you, is probably our number one method of myopia management that we're using. When you and I probably graduated school, I don't know, you must be way younger than me. You at least look at, um, I, w- I was taught to do topography on ortho K and it was just kind of like it either fit and it flattened the lens or, or flattened the cornea or it didn't. Nowadays, with our designs and the knowledge that we have about them, we can get a myopic effect by how we adjust the design. But in order to do that, we do have to understand topography. And I think that we need some new refreshers and so forth. Share with us what you use on your topography or orthokeratology. What are some of the, some of the maps that you use and um, how your topography plays a part in your orthok practice? Um, I think that's a really good question because what I have found um, is that, you know, I have actually students that rotate through my clinic um, from one of the optometry schools. And um, I know this was true when I was a student, but I'm still hearing this feedback from today's students is that the training on topography is very, very shallow, very surface level. Um, You know, they're in optometry school, they're teaching these kids to pass boards. They're not necessarily teaching them how to have a myopia management subspecialty 
um, and all of the you know fine detail that goes into those topographies. And so I think it's really um, important for students to understand that it is it is very valuable to seek outside education, whether it's from continuing education like Vision by Design or whether it's from some of our industry mm -hmm. partners. Um, so when I am um, looking at a child and I'm trying to figure out like, what do I want to do for this child? What's the best fit for them? I was just actually, um, we had a staff meeting this morning um, and uh, I was talking to my staff about different um, levels of difficulty with fitting uh, ortho -K. And I told my staff, um, you know, level of refraction is one thing, but that's only one thing. Then there's also, you know, do they have a lot of, of, of astigmatism or not? And then not just do they have astigmatism, but is it um, located very centrally in the cornea or is it limbus to limbus? Is it with the rule? Is it against the rule? And so we were kind of going over some of these topographical scans. Um, and that's great. I think those are the scans that we are most used to looking at. Um, but mm -hmm. it's not just that that standard axial scan, right? I also am pay paying very close attention to my tangential scan. I am paying very close attention to my elevation map. That's one of the most important um, because you might have a patient who's got what looks like um, pretty standard um, cornea with some with the rule astigmatism. But when you look at that map, you, that elevation map specifically, you might find that within that eight or nine millimeter cord um, of the eye, you have way more elevation in just one quadrant. And, um, and that's gonna tell you a lot about maybe what kind of lens you need to design. Um, or if you have like horizontal versus vertical, if you have more than about 25 or 30 microns of difference in elevation between those two points, then you're definitely looking at a lot different lens design, maybe a toric lens design. Um, and those are let's things you just don't Let's dig into these know. maps. Yeah. So the Say elevation map, you're, let's dig into these yeah. a little bit. So the elevation map, if we were to put, you know, a straight line and mm -hmm. uh, then we were to measure how far things away are from that, that's what the elevation map tells us. And so if you've got a high a, a large elevation difference between one meridian and another it's because there's actually a difference and and that might direct us towards toric peripheral curves it might direct us towards something that gets a better seal like if we if we don't see a good seal it's probably because we didn't evaluate that elevation map and line up the lens that we designed or ordered based off of that what what about the tangential and the axial maps? Explain to us what those maps mean and how you use one of them or the other to help evaluate refraction or whatever it is you do. Um, I think um, when I'm looking at the axial maps, it's really important um, to kind of get an overall impression of the power of the cornea. Um, it kind of helps you see, um, you know, at a quick glance, are they against the rule or are they with the rule? Um, and we know that fitting with the rule, astigmatism um, is much easier with ortho K than oblique astigmatism or against the rule astigmatism. So that's just a like, really quick glance. Um, but then it also helps you very, very quickly visualize whether the astigmatism is very close to the center or whether it goes limbus to limbus. And we know that limbus to limbus astigmatism is much um, more challenging to get good seal as well. Um, and when you're looking at the tangential maps, that's a little bit different. It's giving you a little bit more of a look at kind of like the, the instantaneous um, change um, in shape of the cornea. It's not so much a power map as it is a shape mm -hmm. map. Um, and I always find it very um, difficult to think about E-value. Um, E-value is the eccentricity. It's the rate of flattening from the center of the cornea out to the peripheral cornea. Um, and so I teach my student doctors that rotate through to help use the tangential map in order to visualize the E-value. We know that a lot of the simpler orthokeratology lens designs like CRT, like the ability lens, some of those like off the shelf designs um, really work best for patients that have a very average eccentricity or a very average E value. Um, so around 0 0.5. Um, and so you want to look at that E value and you can, and you can see the number, right? Like you can, a lot of topographers will give you an E value number. Um, but I think 
with really like understanding ortho K and understanding how to fit these lenses at a very high level, it really involves more than just memorizing numbers. Like it's one thing to know that an average E value is 0.5. But if you can really visualize what's happening um, with the rate of flattening um, with the tangential map is a good way to do that. That will help you sort of get more of a deeper understanding of the concept of E-value because you can watch that rate of flattening out in the periphery um, of that corneal map with tangential. Now, beyond just deciding what am I going to do with this initial fit, um, tangential and axial are extremely important when you are um, following these patients back. Um, and it's very important to run the subtractive map or the difference map. Um, so that's when you pull up, you know, I mean, I know you know this, David, but you pull up their baseline and you pull up today's scan and then you look at the sum of those two um, or the subtraction of those two. And when you look at the axial map, that will tell you how much power change you've had. Um, but if you really want to know centration, and if you really want to know the size of your treatment zone, it's much more appropriate to use the tangential difference map in order yeah. to do that. Um, when you see some yeah. of these fancy um, slides and whatever that have that red ring, that red ring, that's on the tangential map that you're seeing that. Yeah. And the reason for this is, is that the axial map is an average of the points. So it's mm -hmm. not an exact difference at from one point to another because the system is taking everything and it's meshing it together in an effort to make a fancy, good-looking picture for us, which we think about refraction and power as a universal. And so when we think about power, a, uh, an axial map is a better way for us to think about the shape with regards to power, but a tangential map is an exacting of each individual point. And so it doesn't care about the averaging of those points. It cares about what is that one point at that one spot. And so you nailed it when we, I, I, I agree with you, not that you, this was a test and you got it right. It's, it, we see the aspect of uh, it being an accurate fit best when we can look at that individual point compared to another individual point and see whether we got a ring of fire or uh, whether there was an increase in the power in that area. And that's why the tangential map looks the best for that. And that difference display map, as you said, can bring this value both from an axial perspective to look at what is the patient's refraction going to come out to be? What would we anticipate their total power? Um, but the tangential is going to tell us much more accurately. How did we do on that on that fit of that lens? Is that how you look at it? Absolutely, yeah. I think it's really um, you know when we're trained on topography, a lot of times the axial map is the only one we've really ever seen before, um, or the only one right. that we've really ever talked much about. And um, when you look at the tangential map, it's kind of intimidating when you um, aren't sure what you're looking at. Um, it's kind of ugly frankly. Um, but I think it's important for optometrists to remember that all of these topographers, um, they all have algorithms, right? And so it, it is it sort of um, the data goes through this algorithm and it's presented in kind of more of a pretty way. Um, and, and so, yeah, it's just important to understand that what you're seeing is not an exact picture always. And there are different ways to look at data points um, on the exact same cornea, the exact same scan. You look at this, you look at the data this way, you run it through a different algorithm to look at the data this way. And that's what all these different maps are doing for us. And we can, um, you know, we can use them in a variety of ways to really elevate how knowledgeable we are on the shapes of the cornea and what the cornea is doing power wise and, and how to best fit that patient, how to best troubleshoot that patient if it doesn't fit the way that we thought it was going to. Yeah, absolutely. What um, what are some things that you feel we could be doing better from an educational perspective? And we actually just did a podcast or just recorded it with Jason Jedlica talking about how do we deal with myopia in the optometry schools. The exciting thing is now that we get into myopia, we start talking more about soft multifocals, orthokeratology, spectacle lenses, and atropine. 
if we're talking about more about orthokeratology, then we've got to do a better job of the topography in that area. And so what are some ways that you see we could be uh, could be doing better? Industry certainly is helping by getting topographies in there, but what uh, what what do you wish your students uh, were were able to walk out of school knowing realistically with the constraints of what they have for boards, right? Yeah, I, I know. Like, it's so hard. I know the schools have a different agenda than I do, but honestly, I think you could. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I'm not trying to be funny. I'm not trying to make you laugh. It's oh. just that, like, we do have different priorities, right? Um, and I want my students to be ready for the real world, whereas they want their students to be ready to pass a hard test. Um, I mean, they want their students to be ready for the real world too. That was probably a little bit harsh, but um, you know, I just, I wish they could have one or two hours of the in-depth topographical um, analysis that we can get. Like when you, you've seen it at boot camp at Vision by Design, right? David, you've seen, Randy Kojima yep. give his lecture. It doesn't take that long to just like walk through, you know, and how do you take a good scan? And what are the pitfalls? Like, what is the difference between the placebo based topography and shine fluke topography? Like, I know that they're getting at least those definitions in school, but I don't think they're getting far enough along to really like understand how that impacts things clinically always. Right. Um, you know, and, and how do you make sure that you're getting great baselines? Like, those are just really important skills yeah. that a lot of these students have to learn after, you know, they leave for rotation or after they graduate and then they have to go to continuing education to really get yeah. good enough at it to be able to fit these specialty contacts. Yeah, if you think you got five good baselines, get five more. If you think you got 10 good ones, get 10 more. You can never go back and get those baselines again, right? Uh, they're so valuable. Absolutely, I agree with you. Yeah. Um, so lay out for us, if I see a ortho -K patient tomorrow, walk me through looking at the topographies and what I'm, and just as a recap, I'm going to, I'm going to go to the elevation for this. I'm going to go to, and, and tell me what I'm going to see as I look at the different maps to help me make a decision. Sure. Um, that's a really good question. So I'm really spoiled um, by choice. I have two different types of topographers. I have a placido based topography system, and then I have a shine flu topography system. So I like to look at both and, um, I will get at least four baselines per eye per instrument. And when I'm looking at them, I'll um, look at all four and then I'll look at the shape indices and see if any of them look like they're, like if there's a single outlier, I throw that guy away. Um, and so I'm looking for repeatable scans, right? And then I always um, say I which of these is not like the others from Sesame Street, right? Which of these is not like the, and then I get rid of it, right? Yeah, yeah, because that's probably not a good scan. Um, and so if I've got several scans that all are really similar, then I'm looking at, okay, um, let's let's dial through. First, we'll look at axial. Then we'll look at the elevation map and we'll look at the tangential map. Um, and so I'm looking at axial again, real quick overview. Do we have astigmatism? Yes or no? Is it with the rule? Is it against the rule? Is it centralized? Is it limbus to limbus? Um, okay, log all of that information, put that aside. All right, next I look at the tangential map um, and I just take a, you know, you've got the E value, right? Um, so that tells you the rate of flattening as you go from central to periphery. Mm -hmm. um, but then I like to visualize it as well um, because that kind of helps me. When you look at these over and over again, you get a really good idea of, okay, this is average, this is steeper than average, this is flatter than average. And then you get a really good idea of, okay, maybe I'm gonna preemptively flatten those alignment curves because if I don't, I feel like that lens is gonna to fit too tight right off the bat or vice versa. Um, and so then the next thing I do is I look at my elevation map and I take my little cursor and I just you know click different points on there and I, and I literally look at what is the elevation at that specific point, inferior, superiorly, what is the elevation at that specific point? on an eight millimeter cord. So like four millimeters away from central. Um, 
inferior four, four millimeters, superior four millimeters, temporal four millimeters, um, nasal. And I'm hoping to see they're all pretty symmetrical. Usually they're not. Um, if they're not, then I'm hoping that at, that at least the vertical are similar to one another. Like maybe yeah. they're minus 34 and maybe the horizontal are plus 12. Well, if, if there's, you know, minus 34 vertically and plus 12 horizontally, well, that's a difference of whatever that is. Don't make me do math. 46 or 46. something? 46. Thank you. So if, if there's that much of a difference on that elevation map, then I like instantaneously know I'm either going to need to do um, a toric design or whatever whatever system you're fitting. Um, if it's wave, you might call it um, a geometrically symmetric design or a freeform design um, rather than a rotationally symmetric design. Um, but yeah, you mm -hmm. need a different alignment curve vertically than you do horizontally if you have that much elevation difference. Um, so that's those are kind of the maps that I walk through. Yeah, um, yeah. I know some people like to look at refractive maps as well. Um, if you're shine fluve topography, you also get to know corneal thickness, which I'm not yep. really sure what to do with that information yet, but I'm always screening for um, keratoconus as well. So, yes. So the fantastic four is your eccentricity, your axial, your tangential, and your elevation maps. I love it. Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Chapman, for walking us through this. It was a delight to have you on the podcast. Yeah, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, and thank you for joining us. Also, thanks to Oculus for their generous support of this podcast. And uh, make sure to like and subscribe. Stay tuned for other episodes of the Myopia Podcast. One, two, three, thank you for tuning in to the Myopia Podcast. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review. And don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.